I had threatened earlier to turn on my calendar, but have myself upside down. So let's do that too. You uh, you are upside down, um, so that's great. It's kind of my protest move. After spending 40 plus hours a week on Teams calls, it does get to the point where you're just kind of tired of having a camera on yourself, especially when you haven't had a haircut since February and may or may not have shaved any time recently. So uh, uh, just to make everybody aware, he wasn't joking about having his camera upside down. Hope everybody can see that. Yeah. I we'll switch it back to the content now. Maybe I should describe to people how to do that sometime. But for that, let's move on. Let's get to the actual content just as soon as I can find the right window here. So Windows Autopilot. Before we dive into the main topic that was on the agenda, which was hybrid Azure AD join over the internet using VPN, I wanted to spend a little bit of time doing a quick recap of some of the things that we had talked about back at Ignite 2019. That seems like a long time ago, but really wasn't that long. It was about eight months ago. And at the time, we had listed uh, 10 items that we were actively working on. So where have we managed to actually make progress? If we look at that list, we are very close to having user-driven hybrid Azure AD join over the internet with VPN support be in public preview. It is in private preview now with about 150 customers trying it out with various different VPN clients. So it's looking good. Any day now that should be available. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We are working on better integration with Configuration Manager. And one of the challenges is a lot of customers don't necessarily want to lift and shift their entire Config Manager task sequence and application set into the cloud and push it out via Intune. Plus, for some of those things like purposely sequencing tasks, Intune doesn't provide that as an option. So we have been slowly chipping away at the ability to integrate Config Manager into the autopilot process. You've seen bits and pieces of that over time, starting off initially with the ability to get content from cloud VPs, cloud management gateways, expanding that then to being able to kick off a task sequence automatically when the Config Manager agent is installed. And uh, then the next step would be integrating that into ESP. So we'll talk about that a little bit more too as we get deeper into this. We had promised to customers the ability to be able to edit group tags. That one's done. You can do that today. Direct computer name assignment. You can do that with Azure AD today. So you can go into Intune, find the registered autopilot device and put in the explicit name that you want to use on the device. That works fine. For hybrid Azure AD join, that gets to option number, uh, item number six, aligning naming options. We still have work to do there. Based on the backlog that we currently have, we don't expect to do that within the next six months, but it is still on our list. Windows Autopilot Deployment Report number five, that's available in public preview inside of the Intune console. So if you go to, I think, devices and then monitor, you'll see the Autopilot Report that shows one row for every autopilot deployment that you do, how long it took, whether it was successful or failed. We're working on expansions to that to also show application and policy details. So that would be your one place to be able to see while the deployment is in progress and after the deployment is completed, the current status of your deployments. Number seven, guided scenarios. We kind of put that one on the back burner to say, yeah, we've got more important things to do right now than create fancy wizards to create, to set up the various different things that you might need to do in Intune. Uh, we'll revisit that one at some point, but for right now, we've lowered the priority on that one. On the enrollment status page, there were requests from customers to be able to target to devices. 
So that is also days away. Before that, you could target ESP profiles only to groups containing users or to all users and devices with the default ESP. With this change that's going live pretty much right now, you'll be able to target device groups as well. And those device groups would, uh, would work just like any other Intune targeting. Because we then have some uh, conflict resolution to work out, we will prefer any device targeted ESPs first, then any user targeted ESP settings before finally deciding to use the default ESP. So that'll be available very soon. We had already released what we called internally the nth user fix. The challenge that we have is when you go through the autopilot process and the user gets signed on and it goes through the user ESP, everything works great. But what happens when a second or third user signs into that device hours or days or weeks or months later and those ESP settings are still in place? The user ESP will show up for every user on the device. And because of the way Intune MDM policy syncs work, it could take anywhere from 15 minutes to eight hours before the necessary MDM syncs happen. So we added an option in the ESP profile to say only show the user ESP for the first user as you're going through UBI. Don't show it for any subsequent users, second, third, fourth, hence the nth user tag. So if that's available now, we have some separate changes that we're making to fix the underlying issue, which is when that second user signs in, we need to make sure that the MDM syncs happen more frequently. So we'll be uh, ensuring that they happen every three minutes. And we also have some other ongoing changes that are being deployed now to address some Intune management extension issues in those cases where uh, it wouldn't properly detect applications that are needed, Win32 applications that are needed for a new user that signs in later. So it's all intertwined and all uh, being worked on. On the network documentation side, you've probably seen the Windows Autopilot page that is a list of links, and each of those links points you to a different list of URLs and IP address ranges and things like that that are needed to make the whole setup work. So you have to make sure that you've set up access for Office and Intune and Autopilot itself and Windows Update and activation and time syncing and all of these pieces we want to get documented into the Office 365 slash Microsoft 365 system that enables you to sync that information into your firewall via uh, a web service that's available that publishes an XML representation of all that. So we are still working on that. That is for me to do some data entry. So that one has been pushed down my priority list a little bit, but as soon as we can come up for air for a little bit, we'll get all of that in place so that you can do that via a human or a machine consumable set of data. There are also then some efforts to build on top of that scripts that can test for connectivity so that you could look at that information via script and try to make connections to all those different needed URLs to make sure that you have all the connectivity in place through your firewalls, through your proxy servers, through your SSL inspection appliances, whatever else you have in place that can get in the way of making this whole modern management process work okay. The last item then on the list, Windows 10 configuration for features, language packs, inbox apps. We've not made a whole lot of progress down that path as far as providing built-in support for doing that via Intune, although I have published scripts and samples like the autopilot branding package that you can make use of to deploy that via Intune as a Win32 app to take care of those items. It's just not as smooth as we would like it to be, so we have more work to do down that path. We'd also talked about future investment areas at Ignite, things that were a little longer time frame that we had hoped to work on. 
We've started working on some of them, like troubleshooting and logging improvements. That is currently in development. We've been building out UI designs for client-side troubleshooting uh, capabilities, like press a special keystroke and get a detailed view of everything that's happened during the autopilot process, be able to see the detailed events and logs that will be restructured to actually be human readable rather than developer readable so that you can more easily figure out what's happened, what's failed, and what you might need to do about it. So that's a, a big effort for, for us over the next few months, working to get that into the next Windows 10 release in the uh, beginning of 2021. So uh, as we work on that, we might be able to figure out how to backport that to previous releases as well. That remains to be seen depending on the implementation that we can get in place. We're still looking at ways of migrating apps and settings from an old computer. That's still off in the future. We're still looking at simplifying the process for configuring Windows 10 preferences and defaults. Intune's great at configuring policies. Config Manager can do that as well, but neither of them are particularly great at configuring initial preferences and allowing the end user to then make changes to those. Like via Intune, how do you set a default desktop wallpaper but allow the user to make changes to that wallpaper? Again, I published samples through the autopilot branding package to provide workarounds for that, but uh, that one's still a little bit off, a little bit farther down the time frame. On the device lifecycle management improvements, there are some improvements to that overall to speed the process up. There are still additional items on our backlog to continue to make that faster, as well as to make it easier to get rid of devices. The offboarding process needs some improvements, so we are working on that. Uh, we'll have more to share on that in the, the upcoming months. Better handling of OS languages. Yeah, we're, we're slowly chipping away at that, working with the language team. You may have seen a blog that I did on Windows 10 2004 and some of the changes that have been made there that help with that. That gets us closer, but we're still envisioning a future scenario where you don't have to worry about it, that Windows 10 will show you a list of all languages and you pick one. If it doesn't happen to be there, it gets installed and the whole process just works. So uh, it's a long term goal, but hopefully we'll eventually get that implemented. When we look in the scenario view of things, user driven hybrid Azure AD join uh, deploy over VPN, that'll be in public preview anytime now. So that's good. White glove and self-deploying mode are still in public preview. We are hoping to get that generally available by the end of this calendar year. The main thing that's held that up is the TPM attestation behavior that we use. Uh, we use the TPM on the device to validate that the device isn't an imposter. So it's used for security reasons, but Initially, when we had imp implemented that in Windows 10 1809, the uh, reliability of that process wasn't the greatest. We were seeing about a 20% failure rate. We believe that's much better in Windows 10 1903, 1909, 2004. We just don't yet have the proof. So we're looking to gather additional telemetry on that so that we can make the call to say, yes, it's meeting our expected reliability goals and that would then take us to general availability. When we look at the scenarios that are the features that cross scenarios, we've talked about some of these already, like disabling the end user and integrating with Config Manager and uh, ESP targeting to users and computers. There is one option that we wanted to add to skip user ESP altogether. You can do it via custom OMA URI policy today, but you can't do it directly in the UI. So that's still on our list. Uh, I think we talked about all the items in the device lifecycle. On the reporting and monitoring side, uh, we've got the autopilot report out there. We're also working on the ability to collect logs remotely. You've probably seen law, uh, blog posts talking about how to do that using the uh, diagnostic CSP, but there's no way built into Intune to initiate that. 
So that's being added so that you could go into a particular device and on the actions pane, just click a button and say collect logs. It would send a request to the device to run a series of commands, gather the output of those commands into a cab or zip file, upload those into blob storage, and then show you those through the Intune portal. So coming soon. Uh, we've added DFCI support for Surface devices. The last two items there, removing the list of inbox apps and adding language packs and features should probably be read. Uh, I've published scripts that show how to do that, but there's nothing built in to do that. Delivery optimization, they've added support for Office 365 Pro Plus. That was planned as of Ignite. That is now in place. That's great. There was one item that we wanted to do for White Glove to handle a particular scenario where a customer might have a connected cache server configuration, but the partner has a different one that they want to use. So uh, there's still some work to do around that, but that's kind of an edge case. We had hoped to have the ability to do a Windows Autopilot update so that we could push out new Autopilot features and fixes just via the Windows Update channel so that you didn't have to install cumulative updates or wait for a new Windows 10 release. You would just get the latest Windows Autopilot update code. That was attempted a few times on Windows 10, 1903, and 1909 based on some challenges with that where the targeting ended up going to millions of machines instead of the intended uh, Autopilot set. We had to go back to the drawing board. We made some changes in Windows 10 2004. We're still validating those changes, and we're hoping that later this year we'll be able to leverage that. Worst case, we had to make additional changes, and then it becomes a Windows 21 H1 item, but uh, we're still hopeful that we can get it out for Windows 10 2004. If you look at the basic pattern for how devices are provisioned overall. Windows 10 enables everything. You have Autopilot, you can do Intune Management, you can do Azure AD Join, you can do Config Manager, AD Join, GPOs, Imaging with OSD and MDT, everything supported. With Windows 10, ARM64, the Config Manager, OSD and MDT item dropped off. There is no ARM64 support in either one of those. When we move to a, a more modern device like HoloLens, you see other things starting to drop off like Config Manager and Active Directory. So uh, as we see new types of devices, including Windows 10X come out, expect more of the same, that the functionality and the provisioning process will be focused around Autopilot, Intune, Azure AD Join. So that is the future. Not to say that we're ever going to take it away from Windows 10, but it is something that won't be present in other types of platforms. All right, let's talk about hybrid Azure AD join with VPN support. The process that we've described before for autopilot and hybrid Azure AD join, I don't think a lot of people completely understand, at least based on the questions that I get, where they're always asking, does the device need to talk to an Active Directory domain controller to do the offline domain join? Well, that would kind of make it an online domain join, not an offline domain join. So let's walk through the process. In the basic process is that the device is going to boot up. It's going to send its hardware ID to the autopilot deployment service. The autopilot deployment service responds back saying, here's your autopilot profile. That profile would say, this is a device that should be joined to Active Directory. All right, the device will then recognize that and do an MDM enrollment. It will directly enroll in Intune before it's been joined to anything. So there's no Active Directory join, there's no Azure AD join, there's just the user who's put in their Azure AD credentials. Those Azure AD credentials are used to perform the MDM enrollment to Intune. Intune will recognize as part of the MDM sync that this device needs to be hybrid Azure AD join. So it will then send a request to the offline domain join connector. 
the offline domain join connector never makes uh, any communication with the device itself and Intune never actually talks to the offline domain join connector service running inside of your environment. The connector always makes an outbound connection. So on a server inside your environment, you install this uh, offline domain join connector. The official name is the Intune connector for Active Directory. It will pull Intune looking for these ODJ requests. When it finds one, it will download it it'll process it, and then it will upload the offline domain join blob. Going back to Windows, I think Windows Vista, there have been APIs in place to allow for creating an offline domain join blob. If you've ever played around with djoin.exe, the APIs behind that are exactly what we're using to create an object in Active Directory for the device to capture that blob of data and to send it back to Intune. Once Intune gets it, the next time the device does an MDM sync, which at this point it's doing about every three minutes, it will send that blob to the device. The device will apply that blob, which makes it fully Active Directory joined at that point. It's never been talking to a domain controller itself yet at this point. It's just received the offline domain join blob it needs to reboot to complete the join, but other than that, it is a fully Active Directory join machine at that point. The challenge then is that we added a step into this process. This is autopilot logic that will look at the domain join, do a DNS lookup to find a domain controller, and then try to ping that domain controller. Because we want to make sure before we reboot the machine to continue the process, that there's some chance of success at the end of this process. You'd hate to go through a two hour provisioning process and then find out at the end that you can't sign into the device. So the goal here was to fail early, that if we couldn't ping a domain controller, there was no chance of succeeding. So we might as well give you an error at this point after we've tried for 40 minutes is the default interval before we give up and say that, yeah, sorry, this isn't going to proceed. If the ping would work, well, then the end user would have the opportunity later in the process to sign in talking to the Active Directory domain controller to validate their credentials. So that's the, the first point where you really need connectivity to Active Directory. Having line of sight to a DC is to validate those domain credentials. So that's the way the whole process works. What we want to change is to eliminate that ping test. It's the simplest possible change to a process. We've just removed code, and it's not very much code. We've added an option into Autopilot that allows you to tell the client to not do that ping test. Inside the UI, it's called skipping the connectivity check. We'll see what that looks like in a minute. But with that removed, we'll just say, OK, you know best so we will continue through the process and it's up to you to make sure that by the time the user needs to sign into the active directory join device using their active directory credentials that need to be validated by an active directory domain controller there better be connectivity to the network so that that can be completed that's where the vpn client comes in you need a vpn client in order to established connectivity for that sign-on process to work, that initial sign-on to cache the credentials on the device. After that initial sign-on, you could sign on with cache credentials from that point on and be fine, but uh, you do need connectivity for that initial sign-on. You also need connectivity for other things like the hybrid Azure AD join device registration process to receive device GPOs, to, to do a variety of other things that aren't necessarily quite as critical, but certainly being able to log on to the machine is very critical. So it is important that the necessary pieces are in place. So let's look at what that process would appear like to the end user. The device is going to boot up and the user will choose the language, locale, keyboard, 
all the standard settings and then connect to a network, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, doesn't matter. And eventually they will authenticate. So they'll type in their Azure AD credentials. They type in those credentials so that we have the ability to enroll the device in Intune. In this case, I used phone sign in instead of a password to sign in to get my Azure AD user token. But at that point, we will enroll the device in Intune. Intune already processed the uh, offline domain join request, sent the blob back to the device. We've skipped the connectivity check, so we just blindly reboot and continue on with the process. After the reboot, we'll display the enrollment status page to track the progress as we're provisioning the device. So now all the apps and policies and certificates and everything else that we need is being installed on the device at that point. So this is where I would install my VPN client, whether it's Cisco AnyConnect or anything else like that, but I might need a machine certificate to go along with that. That can be delivered to the device via SCEP. So I'm just getting the device ready, not just with the configuration that you would typically deploy, but also the VPN configuration that we're gonna need to sign on with later. For this particular device, I use the inbox Windows VPN client talking to an RAS server. Not an RAS, not an always on setup, but a, a manual VPN connection, like the old RAS style. With that, you get this extra icon on the logon screen, the network sign on icon. If you click that, you get to make the VPN connection directly from the sign on page. So this is one of the two patterns that we would need to go through. Pattern number one, you manually initiate that VPN connection. Pattern number two, well, as soon as the VPN client is installed, it automatically connects and the connectivity is just there. So with that VPN connection in place, I have the line of sight to a domain controller. I can put in my Active Directory credentials. They can be validated and cached. The first sign-on experience happens and we're then fully provisioned. But not quite. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. In, you'll, see, you'll notice in that case, I had the user ESP disabled. So we went directly from the first sign-in animation, the welcome, we're getting your device ready screens to the desktop without displaying user ESP. And there's a reason for that. The reason is the user ESP would time out because of some of the, the background processes with hybrid Azure AD join not yet completing. But I'll go through that, all, that whole flow uh, in a little bit. Let's first talk a little bit more about the requirements for setting this up. First thing, we need a supported Windows 10 version. We wrote the, the change to skip the connectivity check in the Windows 10 2004 release. We backported that change from Windows 10 2004 into the December cumulative update for Windows 10 1903 and 1909. So that gives you a good idea of the time frame that uh, all of that stuff was completed. So if you have one of those OSs, this is already fully supported client side. Some of you noticed in release notes for cumulative updates that we added this capability. Well, that's only half of the problem. The other half of the problem is we need additional support in Intune to drive this. That's where the skipped connectivity check setting comes in. That is currently behind a private preview flight in Intune, so not everyone sees it. As soon as the current Intune deployment for this month's new features completes, then it's going to show up for everyone so that you can go into your hybrid Azure AD join profile and check the box. You then need to make sure that you can deploy the needed configuration during device ESP. That would include a Win32 VPN client. That VPN client usually has the VPN profile settings like the, the host name and any other configuration that's needed bundled into the app installer. So you may not need to deploy anything else uh, beyond the application. Then it just depends on how you're authenticating your VPN connections. If you're using machine certificates, great, you can deploy those via SCEP. 
if you're using uh, phone authentication or uh, RSA tokens or who knows whatever else you might be using, well, it's up to you to make sure that any necessary configuration for that is deployed from Intune as a Win32 app prior to the user getting to that sign up page. Then the VPN connection will either automatically be established or manually from the Windows logon screen. Those pre logon authentication module capabilities, which are called PLAP, that's the API that was, I think, around even in Windows XP that uh, enabled you to uh, do that VPN connection from the logon screen. It's basically the same problem that you would have with. A password change. Let's assume an employee goes on vacation, they forget their password, they're working from home, they call the help desk, you reset their password, they still can't sign on to the device because to use their new password, they need line of sight to a domain controller in order for that domain controller to validate their ID and password. We have the exact same problem here, so no surprise, we're using the exact same solution to solve that problem. The new option that will be available in Intune for the hybrid Azure AD join profile is the skip connectivity check item. All you need to do after this is available in public preview is go in and change that from the default of no to yes. When you change it to yes, you're basically saying, I now have the responsibility to ensure connectivity at the right point in time myself. I'm going to deploy that from Intune as part of this process. We noted that in the Intune in development page that was published, I think it came out back in April, we then had a one month delay as we needed to go through some additional validation. So it then disappeared and then we put it back and then we had a possible additional delay. So it disappeared again, but it is now back again to confirm that this is in development coming soon. So. That's the public preview item now that will be available shortly. So hopefully you'll be seeing that in the what's new notes for Intune very soon. We'll also be updating the autopilot documentation both in Intune doc sets and in the autopilot doc set, which as Aaron mentioned earlier are merging together. So that'll go live at the same time. So let's talk about VPN clients then. We have a dependency on VPN to make this work, we don't want customers to have to change their entire VPN infrastructure to make this work. So for us, it's important to support any VPN client. By support, we basically say we'll provide a framework and all of these VPN clients should be able to plug into it. We've done a fair amount of research on these, reading through the documentation to find what we think would work, but we haven't validated these in our own labs because, well, we don't have a any connect environment, a pulse secure environment, a global protect environment. We just have our own VPN environment. So we can test out always on VPN and things like that, but we can't test out all those others. That's where we got into the private preview to work with customers to make sure that they could cover those. As we've been going through that process, we've added to this list, most recently added the F5 big, big IP edge client to the list because yeah, we've seen that there, there are documented solutions to make this work. So we'll continue building up that list, but one of the challenges is we can't actually publish that list on our doc site. So expect to see more blog information with links to that. Now there are some things that we know won't work like any UWP plugin based VPN setup because we can't leverage those VPN plugins before the user signs in. So using that as a mechanism to allow the user sign in obviously doesn't work. We obviously can't use user certs for authentication either. Same reason, you can't get a user cert to a device before the user signed in you can't make a VPN connection without the user cert, well, you're pretty well stuck at that point. So device certs or some other authentication mechanisms required. We also have no way to provision direct access today. 
it would work if we did have a way through the offline domain join process to get the policies and certificates to the device. It is technically possible, but there's additional work that we would need to do in the ODJ connector and in Intune and potentially even on the client side to make that end-to-end -end process work. That is lower on our priority list, so we're not sure that it will happen anytime soon, if at all, but there are there are ways to make it work. So uh, if we get a, a bunch of feedback from customers saying that that is required, yeah, we could consider it. For anything that's not on the list, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that we don't know for sure. As long as it meets the general requirements of automatically connecting prior to the logon screen or being able to be initiated from the logon screen itself, then it should work just fine. The links that we'll publish in the near future, probably through my blog, are just links into the documentation for all of the different VPN clients that are out there. Every one of them calls this something different. So depending on the client that you're using, you have to know what to look for. So these are the hints. If you're using AnyConnect, the feature is called Start Before Logon. Pulse Secure, it's called a credential provider. Global Protect is called Pre Logon. Checkpoint, doesn't have a manual mechanism, but they support always connecting, always connecting. Uh, Citrix NetScaler has an always on uh, option. SonicWall NetExtender has an on startup option. The F5 Edge client has what's called a dial up entry Windows logon integration. And always on VPN, if you want to use a Microsoft data solution, VPN device tunnels. If you set up a VPN device tunnel, it'll all, it'll automatically connect and enable the user to sign in. On that last item, one of the challenges that we have is configuring an always on VPN connection. We also documented in the in development page that we're working on improvements to that because today in Intune, you can't create an always on device tunnel connection and you can't configure it with the necessary cryptography suite settings to make it connect with your server using the appropriate settings. Now, a lot of people work around that through custom OMA URIs and PowerShell scripts and profile XMLs and uh, other painful ways to set that up, but we want to make it simple so that you can just go into Intune, check a couple of boxes and be able to push that out. So that's in development now. Hopefully that'll be available in the near future so that if you're going the always on VPN route, that will at least make the connection profile definition really simple to do through Intune. In the video that I had showed, the process that I used was to use the inbox VPN client, but not in an always on VPN style. So this isn't an automatically connecting VPN connection. This is a manually connecting VPN connection. So you could do this as well if you've got a VPN client that works like this. If it uses the one of the protocols that's supported by the built-in client, you could just skip a Win32 client and use the inbox one using um, SSTP or PPTP or uh, L2TP or I think Ike V2 are the inbox supported protocols. The big trick is that you need to specify that it's an all user connection. By default, VPN connections are per user and there's no user prior to logon. So a per user connection does no good on the logon page. But an all user connection enables that network sign in button so that the user can click it and make a VPN connection from the logon screen. So in my case, I took that PowerShell script bundled it into a Win32 app and pushed it out via Intune so that I could make sure that it was installed by the end of device ESP so that you could then make a connection and sign into Windows using that connection. So that's the basic setup. The next gotcha is the hybrid Azure AD join process itself. So it's useful to spend a little bit of time explaining how this process works separately from autopilot, because this isn't really an autopilot process. This is just the way an Active Directory join device goes through the process of registering itself in Azure AD 
so that you get to that hybrid Azure AD joint state. So you're starting off with that Active Directory joint computer. This could be all the way after the autopilot process. It's asynchronous happening in the background. It's whenever it can successfully complete all the steps. The first step that it's going to perform is to query Active Directory. It'll do an LDAP query against Active Directory to find a particular object in Active Directory called a, a service connection point, SCP. That SCP object contains details about the Azure AD tenant that it needs to register with. Without that, the AD joint computer has no idea what Azure AD tenant is associated with the Active Directory tenant that it's joined to. So it queries the SCP and it gets back the Azure AD tenant details. At that point, it knows, okay, now that I've got the AAD tenant info, I need to reach out to Azure AD and try to register. But in order to complete that registration, there's another step that I need to do first to authenticate with Azure AD. There's a certificate that the computer will generate, a self-signed cert that it will store a reference to in the user certificate field in the Active Directory computer object for that device. So the computer generates a cert, stores it, and puts the details into the AD computer object. Obviously, that requires connectivity back to the domain controller as well. So think back to that VPN scenario. Is that If that's an always on or automatically connecting VPN, all this stuff will happen in the background as soon as that connection is available. If this is a manually uh, connecting scenario, none of this is going to happen until the user manually makes that connection and signs into the device. There are other implications for that as well. But all right, so let's assume the user certificate is updated in Active Directory. At that point, AAD Connect will see the object and see that the user certificate has been populated and it will then sync the device into Azure AD. Prior to that, it won't sync the object. So even if you have joined the device hours earlier and it sat in Active Directory for hours, it's not going to be synchronized into Azure AD until that user certificate property is populated. So you go through the Azure AD Connect sync and once that completes, or that runs every 30 minutes by default, then the device is able to send a device registration request up to Azure AD. Azure AD will compare that registration request against the certificate details that it got through Azure AD Connect, assuming those match. It knows it's not an imposter, so it will then send a device certificate back down to the device to complete the process. After step six is completed, the user can then get an Azure AD user token when they sign in to the device or when they unlock the device. And that Azure AD user token is used to authenticate a session to Intune to do any user policies. It's used for single sign-on into Teams and OneDrive and uh, Office 365 and every other Azure protected service. So until that whole process is completed and the user either signs out and signs back in again or locks and unlocks their device, they don't have an Azure AD user token to access any of those services. That's why going back to the, the video that we walked through, I turned off user ESP because without an Azure AD user token, there's no way that user ESP can ever complete because we can never talk to Intune to get the policy. Eventually, after all these steps go through, it'll work just fine and the policies will flow down. But that could take longer than the typical one hour ESP timeout value that I've configured, especially if the user doesn't know that they need to do something after all of this is completed, like they need to sign out, sign back in again, or they need to lock and unlock. I mean, this is all background stuff that the end user is never aware of. So it's useful to understand this. This is a, kind of the non-ADFS flow. If you're using ADFS, the process is actually different because the device registration can happen without the user certificate being updated in Active Directory. It can happen without the AAD Connect sync. 
So the whole process can be faster with ADFS, but uh, the goal overall is to move away from ADFS, not toward it. So uh, don't consider this a reason to implement ADFS. All right, next topic, integration with Config Manager. We've been working on that through various steps. Biggest step was being able to invoke a task sequence as part of the autopilot deployment process. So you can create an application in Intune to deploy the Config Manager uh, agent bootstrap, CCM setup.msi, as an app down to the device. With the changes that were made in Config Manager, you can now add a parameter called provision TS and specify the ID of the task sequence that you want the Config Manager agent to run as soon as it's finished initializing itself. So that all gets pushed down by Intune to the client. The Config Manager agent installs, it runs that, and everything's great. Except there's no ESP integration. So the task sequence will run. You'll be able to see the progress UI for the task sequence appearing in front of the uh, autopilot enrollment status page. But since the autopilot enrollment status page doesn't know what's going on with the task sequence, it's likely going to complete before the task sequence does. So the provisioning still happens, but the user can get to the desktop and start to do things before everything has been provisioned, which may confuse them. And they call the help desk and say, well, where's Office or something like that? Or it could cause security and compliance and conditional access issues, things like that too. So. There is a desire to then enable additional integration so that we can have the process flow be as I've described here. We want the device to join Azure AD or Active Directory, enroll in Intune in the hybrid Azure AD join case. Those steps are actually in the reverse order. Intune will then push the config manager agent, CCM setup.msi, down to the device. That will eventually start up the CCM setup our C, yeah CCM setup service the service will download the agent installation files the config manager agent will be installed it will register itself with the uh, site either via, via the CMG or an on-prem management point and it will then see okay now I can run the task sequence with the ID that was specified so that task sequence starts to do the OS provisioning work this last step then is what we need to add. We need to add the ability to track the progress during ESP. We have an extensibility model in place already to support that so the config manager can register itself with ESP to say, here's something I want you to track. And once those pieces are in place, then ESP will treat this just like an app. It's just an app that will run for a long time. So you might see a status of apps, zero of one, while the task sequence is running with the task sequence progress UI um, up to the forefront so that you can actually see what's going on. So that's what we're working on. At the same time, we want to make it easier to deploy the Config Manager agent out, the, out to the device. So we've been looking at options to integrate this into Intune. So our current thinking is that we would add some co-management settings into Intune similar to the settings that we have in Config Manager today, where you can specify who, which source should be authoritative for workload ownership. Should it be Intune, should it be Config Manager? If you say it's Config Manager, well, then the workload settings in Config Manager apply. If you say it's Intune, then uh, Intune controls all workloads. If you specify a workload ownership of Configuration Manager, that's a pretty good sign that Intune should probably make sure that the Config Manager agent is deployed. But even if you say Intune is owning all the workloads, you still may want to deploy the Config Manager agent for break glass or other similar scenarios where you want to leverage some specific capabilities of Config Manager, maybe CM Pivot or something like that, or extensible inventory or whatever you want. Uh, even though Intune owns the workload. So you can manually then specify that, yeah, I still want to deploy the Config Manager agent even though Intune owns the workloads. And as before on the app, you need to specify all the client installation command line arguments. So you would specify those here. 
These settings could then be assigned to groups of devices so that you could have different behaviors for different groups. Maybe there is a group of devices where all the workloads should be owned by Intune and a different set where they all should be owned by Config Manager. So we'll have the ability to do targeting based on that. So that's what we're working on now. Hopefully later this year, we'll have all of this in place and all of this working smoothly end to end. Uh, we were, I think we're still hoping that we can get uh, kind of the working end to end solution, at least to a point where we can demonstrate it for the Ignite conference later this year, even though it's going to be virtual. So hopefully you'll see more around that at that point. And that's all I had. Okay. Timing, 10, 10, my time. That gives us what, five minutes for Q&A? You got five minutes, we sure do. Um, you were, we're probably asked to uh, have you stick around for a little bit and, and maybe answer some more in the chat, depending on what we can get through. Um, yeah. Just as a reminder, publish first and then respond if you would. Uh, okay. But I'll, I'll go down through a couple of them here. We had some good ones. Um, Duncan asked, are there any plans to merge the device configuration report post autopilot for ensuring white glove has a big green button for complete? And then he says in tune settings applied and autopilot complete. In tune settings applied. Not quite sure I understand the question 100%. Okay, we can ask Duncan. Duncan, if you're still out there, uh, go ahead and, and uh, in the Q&A just uh, Maybe elaborate a little bit, and we'll we'll make sure that he answers that. Um, yep. What was another one that I was going to ask here? It was uh, <laughs> uh, there was a question about ADFS and the hybrid AV join. I think you answered that one. Um, whether it was possible, we sure did. Um, God, I got so many of them here. Let's find another one. One second. Provision TS uh, isn't supported for an AAD joined device with a CMG and internet facing management point is still a requirement to be changed for the future. I'm not sure if that's one for you. So AAD join provision TS. Isn't supported um, with a CMG. Internet facing management point is still a requirement. Uh, no, because I do that all the time. <laughs> That's why I was a little puzzled by that comment. I mean, the basic challenge is that you need to get the config manager agent installed so that it can then register itself with the site. So if you think about an Azure AD joined device, it's kind of like always on the internet. So let's assume that you've got a, an Azure AD joined device on the internet and it enrolls in Intune, in, Intune pushes CCM setup.msi down to the device. CCM setup.msi is going to run and install the CCM setup service, which is then going to try to authenticate to the CMG to figure out uh, what client bits it needs to install. So there's the question. How is the device able to authenticate with the CMG? There's basically two ways that it can do that. One of those is using an Azure AD token. The other is via PKI cert. There's technically a third way using a token, but uh, that's a, a little harder to do. But so it should be possible. It's just not necessarily possible in every variation. Like let's look at a, a white glove scenario as an example. In the white glove scenario, there might not be an AAD user token. So in those cases, there may be a need to do a PKI based authentication. So you need to push out a machine cert to the device. So uh, we've been having conversations around that about documenting all the different scenarios and security requirements and authentication requirements to make sure that that works. But certainly the desire is regardless of the scenario, you should be able to get the config manager agent installed and get it to run a task sequence from anywhere. Okay. Um, got one more and then Duncan expanded his question for us a little bit, but this is from Amos. Any chance of having task sequences run natively within Intune? It would be great to run apps and scripts, for example, in a certain order. We've talked about that. Uh, the 
I think the general opinions, and they are just opinions at this point because we don't have any formal plans, the general opinion is that we don't want to recreate all the complexity in Intune. So certainly the ability to do ordering and uh, dependencies even between say PowerShell scripts and policies and apps, I think we'll eventually need to consider options like that. At the moment, more of our focus is on integrating what you already have with config manager and task sequences and looking more longer term at uh, other options for sequencing if you wanted to go uh, entirely in tune for this process. Great, okay, and then um, just like I said, Duncan expanded his question a little bit. He's asking about the the, the post reports. Basically, essentially all Intune config, um, the custom profiles, endpoint protection, all the user profiles, ensuring they have run and applied post autopilot completion so they know a device is ready and hand off to an end user. Okay. Yeah, I mean, our intent overall is for the enrollment status page to track everything you want to be blocking and to prevent access to the desktop until all of those items have been processed. So I guess an example, let's say you have 10 applications that you have said are mandatory for the device. They're required deployments from Intune. And you can configure in device ESP that only five of those should be considered blocking. So the Intune management extensions as it's installing those knows that, oh, okay, I'm only going to process five of those apps during device ESP, and I'm gonna hold off the other five until the autopilot process is 100% complete. After the autopilot process is complete, the user gets access, access to the desktop, but there's still provisioning tasks that are going on in the background. You will see notifications from Intune, from Intune management extensions, to tell you that it's still doing things like installing additional applications. And there is a notification that goes out uh, separately from that that says your device is now fully ready to go which is a little deceiving because it might not actually be so yeah it is feedback that we've heard we just haven't yet figured out a nice clean way to know when things are truly 100 percent done especially when we consider some of it could be coming from Intune directly some of it could be coming from Intune management extensions some of it could be coming from config manager there are also group policies in play if it's a hybrid Azure AD join device. So it's tricky to be able to say 100% of the configuration is in place. If it's absolutely required, we want to block during ESP to make sure that you don't get to the desktop. But if it's not quite absolutely required and you just want to know when it's done, that's a lot harder. All right. Well, first off, uh, thank you, Mr. Niehaus. We appreciate you uh, taking the time today and, and presenting with this. Um, if you would stick around, there's a lot of other great questions that are in the Q&A. Um, uh, if you think other people would enjoy them, just hit that publish button first and then answer them.